happy to announce that on Friday we have our food giveaway and she needs help. 9.30 Friday morning. I'm done with school. gift of a new day. A new day with surprising miracles. Kindness to be shared. A gift of a new day. Let us receive it with joy.
Please remain standing for the unison prayer. O oh God, we trust in your power, even as it is often found in weakness, in your wisdom, even as it is expressed in seeming foolishness, in your wholeness, even as it comes to us when they are broken. We do not ask this day for dazzling displays of strength, electric exercises of intellectual prowess, or marvelous manifestations and miracles. We come simply to worship you. Touch us this day, O oh Lord, sinners that we are, that we might become your saints, your body, your children, your church. For this temple, Spirit is built not upon our own abilities, knowledge, or restorative skill, but upon you, through Jesus Christ. Amen. May the grace and peace of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to pass the peace. come to you, O Christ, on this summer morning, as our bodies begin to breathe more deeply and more freely, for our hopes rest in your vision for our world, your courage, your sacrifice, your focus, your patience, your purest joy, and your tireless love. Fill us with these holy aspirations. Fill us with you. Come to pray for all the people throughout the world. God, we pray for the well-being and flourishment of your beloved children. Sounds okay. Yeah. And walk in the reconciliation of all nations and people. Through your spirit, come and make all the world one. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for those who have served in the armed forces of our country. We pray for the servicemen and women who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God. And for those who love them in death as in life, we now offer the distress of our grief and the sadness of our loss into your arms of mercy. God, we 
into places of death, cause us to take note of places you are bringing new life. Strengthen us while we live out our life on this earth to show the compassion and the caring of Jesus. Hold before us the reality of your kingdom where there is no suffering, pain, or regret so that we may share it with those who are without hope. And now we pray all these things in your son's name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture lesson for today is found in 1 Samuel um, chapter 17. I won't be reading all of those verses in the bulletin because I'd be here for the rest of the afternoon. Um, uh, I will be reading verses 24 through 40. When the Israeli, when, I'll start again. When the Israelites saw Goliath, Every one of them ran away terrified of him. Don't let anyone lose courage because of this Philistine, David told Saul. I, your servant, will go and fight him. You can't go out and fight this Philistine, Saul answered David. You are still a boy, but he was a warrior since he was a boy. Your servant has kept his father's sheep, David replied to Saul. And if ever a lion or a bear came and carried off one of the flock, I would go after it strike it, and rescue the animal from its mouth. If it turned on me, I would grab it at his jaw, strike it, and kill it. Your servant has fought both lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them because he has insulted the army of the living God. 
The Lord, David added, who rescued me from the power of both lions and bears will rescue me from the power of this Philistine. Go, Saul replied to David, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own gear, putting a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David strapped his sword over the armor, but he couldn't walk around well because he'd never tried it before. I can't walk like this, David told Saul, because I've never tried it before. So he took them off. Then he grabbed his staff, chose five smooth, smooth stones from the stream bed. He put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag and with sling in hand, went out to the Philistine. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. An archaeologist was digging in Israel and came upon a casket containing a mummy. After examining it, he called the curator of a prestigious museum and said, hey, I just discovered a 3,000-year-old mummy of a man who died of heart failure. To which the curator replied, well, bring him in. We'll check it out. A week later, the amazed curator called the archaeologist. You were right about the mummy's age and cause of death. How in the world did you know? Easy, replied the archaeologist. There was a piece of papyrus in his hand that said, 10,000 shekels on Goliath. <laughs> it's a morning when it's good to start with a little humor. I think it's safe to say that even those who might not have grown up going to church and Sunday school are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Those of us who did grow up in Sunday school have known the story since we were small. It was often used to remind us when we were children that even though we were small, we had the power to do great things if we could learn to rely on God and not ourselves. Let me take just a moment to remind you of the story, even though it was just read and we've heard it before, let's hear it again. David had never seen so many soldiers in one place. The Philistine army is spread out across the battlefield, ready for action. A sea of breastplates, helmets, leather and bronze. At the vanguard stands Goliath, their champion his mighty legs looking like two tree trunks rooted to the ground. Goliath is the shock and awe of the Philistine army. And the shock and awe was working. The soldiers of Judah cannot find a champion to go against him. Not even Saul, that miserable excuse for a king. In fact, most of the soldiers had fled. They ran away. They were scared. The one who steps forward at last is an odd choice. He's only a boy. His name is David, a shepherd who is the son of a shepherd, a nobody. Saul had offered to loan David his kingly armor, and at first David tried it on, but as we heard, it didn't feel right. It didn't fit. It wasn't him. And so he cast it aside. As he takes the field, he's wearing only the homespun tunic of a shepherd. The only weapon that he brings in his hand is a simple leather sling. A strap from his hand holds that sling designed to hold a single stone. Goliath doesn't take David seriously. Why would he? 
It's true that great many of the combat challenges of Goliath have turned and fled, and he's never had to fight anybody. But here's David standing there, and Goliath is not going to scare him away. Today, Goliath has an opponent, if you can call him that. I brought a leather pouch with me today. I have something inside of it. Five smooth stones. It's all David had. Five smooth stones. Simple things that, you know, I picked up on my travels. I collect stones, which is not a good thing necessarily. But I had some small ones, and most of these came from the ocean, the rocky coast of Maine. We all know what happens after an interlude of trash talking by the Philistine Colossus, David reaches in and picks up one stone, just one. He puts it in his sling. He swirls it around his head as Goliath lumbers towards him and he lets it go. Hits Goliath in the forehead, killing him instantly. Would that were it always that simple to defeat our enemies. Against all odds, David defeated Goliath. David won, and through him, the Israelites won. But no, David would rather say God won. God won because God is a powerful God who roots for and encourages the underdog. I will admit to you that I have a soft spot in my heart for underdogs. Most of you who know me know I don't root for any teams. And if there's a team that's already always winning, I'm probably going to root against them if I root at all. But when that horse won the Kentucky Derby, I cheered. Someone who, a horse who had never run before, never raced before in a in a race this magnificent, and he came from behind against all odds, and he won. I think one of the many reasons the Ukrainians are receiving such support is that they're the underdogs. In this horrific battle for the soul of a nation, they didn't ask for this war. In a way, they remind us of us. We know that our winning the revolution was a fluke. It never, never should have happened against an empire like Britain. And yet, we won. Was God on the side of the, side of the Israelites? Our Bible would insist that he was. Is God on the side of the Ukrainian people? Certainly God is not on the side of those who would kill indiscriminately was God on the side of those fighting to form a new nation in the revolution? I am confident that God's choice would have been a peace table where none of his children had to die. Whose side was God on in the Civil War? A war, to my way of thinking, in which there were no winners. It's Memorial Day. And it was formed in response to the many who died in the Civil War, a day to commemorate those who had died. Initially, however, only Union soldiers were commemorated. Fortunately, wisdom prevailed at some point, and that changed so that all who died in war were commemorated. In 1966, a book came out. I don't know if anybody's read it. I read it a long time ago. It's called Five Smooth Stones, written by Anne Fairbairn. It tells the story of an American, of an America sundered by racial conflict. David Chaplin is a black man born into poverty in Depression-era New Orleans, who makes his way up the ladder of success, 
only to sacrifice everything to lead his people in the civil rights movement. Sarah Kent is the white girl who loves David from the moment she first sees him and who struggles against his belief that it won't work. They can't be together. It's wrong in the violent world he has to confront. And the five smooth stones, of course, are those amazing stones that David has in his pouch. It's an amazing novel, but I read it a long time ago, and I don't remember all the details. I do remember that the novel is a tragedy. It does not have a happy ending. However, out of that novel, there was a challenge to the white people to rethink what it means to be a minority in a society of seeming Goliaths when we were the Goliaths. The true underdogs in any conflict are those left behind to pick up the pieces. It's been a horrific week. And I could have wished I was doing a sermon any other week. It isn't the first time I've had to do that, and unfortunately, I'm afraid it won't be the last. The underdogs are the families left behind to grieve. The underdog is a community that will never be the same. The underdog is the family of the young man who entered the school with a gun. How could you survive knowing that it was your son or your grandson who broke? A lot will depend on what those of us, and that's all of us who mourn this day, a lot will depend on what those of us left behind do to make changes before our country destroys itself. And I do believe we're on that track. There is a monument at Gettysburg, and I've told you this story before on Memorial Day a few years ago. It's worth hearing again. There is a monument. It's the only monument in all of the Gettysburg, Gettysburg battlefield that commemorates a single individual soldier his name was Amos Humiston and his family. And by extension, it memorializes all families on both sides that were disrupted by the tragedies of war. And I would suggest that it memorializes much more than that. Amos was a young private found on the battlefield after the battle at Gettysburg. No one knew who he was, no one knew his name, but he had a picture clutched in his hand. It would have been the last thing he looked at before he died. It was a picture of his wife and his three small children. And it was that picture that allowed them to identify Amos. His wife's name was Felinda. The monument memorizes all women like Felinda those who stayed home, those who have had to raise their families alone because their husband or wife didn't come home from a war, those families left behind in Sandy Hook, those families left behind at Uvalde, who must live with what they saw and must decide how to respond to the tragedy that touched them. I imagine at some point that maybe Goliath had a mother, maybe Goliath had a wife, maybe Goliath had children. Felinda raised three children by herself to adulthood. One of them even became a doctor. The monument memorializes all the families that never were the potential lost because a young man or a young woman never made it home or someone entered a school with a gun. The potential lost when 19 children and two teachers die when they shouldn't have. 
It commemorates the lost poems, the lost songs, the lost talent, all that could have been and will not be. It also needs to remind us that the love of God for us that cannot die is God's spirit entering us even when we are at our worst, even when our spirit threatens to overcome God's spirit. God's spirit always, always triumphs because it is God's spirit within, God's love for us which always triumphs over death. We need to listen to the voices of the children, those who died, Many tapes have been shown of some of them. And those who are left behind, there was an image, I think it was on the news this morning, um, of a little three-year-old girl standing at one of the crosses and signing her name. I think it reminds us that God's desire for us is that we should be so filled with God's Holy Spirit that we would dream of the day when all can live life to the fullest, enjoying the thrill of God's spirit within us, helping us to love even those whom we would hate. It reminds us that in our hearts, we dream of a day when no one will have to die to make us free, but when we can all live to make us free. 19 children, Two adulterers won't have that chance. But those left behind, those of us who mourn this day, have the power that God gave David. We have the power within us to make a difference. I truly believe that God is not on anyone's side in any war, whether that war be on a battlefield in Israel or in Ukraine, or in our schools, or even in our homes. On that day, on a battlefield in Israel, God was on David's side, not because he killed Goliath, but because he chose to make a difference. I can only hope and pray, and we certainly need to do more than that. It has been posted many times but I can only hope and pray that out of tragedy will come the small, unknown people who are willing to speak truth to power, to challenge status quo thinking, and to find a way forward. Our prayers truly need to be that we might find a way, in however small a way, to be one of those people who make a difference. May God make it so. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, in the midst of tragedy, you are with us. Help us as we find ways to move forward. Help us in each of our little ways to make a difference in a world that is struggling. In your name we pray. Amen.
our gifts, and our money. I invite you at this time to be prepared to give as our ushers come amongst us. Gracious and eternal Lord, we give to you out of our abundance. We give to you because you first gave to us. Bless these gifts, O Lord, that they may be multiplied and divided and go out to serve a needy world. Amen.
And now may the God whose love passes all understanding rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Go, and may the peace of God go with you.